Hello and welcome to our monthly live tea broadcast where we can discuss tea and whatever you like, drink some tea together. I think we should start like that. We can drink uh, three bowls or three cups if you're enjoying tea in a cup. But uh, we'll start that way. Drink, drink three cups, three bowls together in silence. Enjoy some tea together through this virtual connection. He's off so you don't have to listen to me slurp.
hope that was as wonderful for you as it was for me. So uh, before we move into your questions, we can talk about uh, your questions or about the, this month's very special issue, the, all about the classics of tea. It's the uh, Shu Cha Jing, the sequel to the uh, Tea Sutra. And uh, this is part two. That book's very long, so we're going to have to spread it over three issues. Took a lot of work to translate and annotate. And uh, yes, yeah, very special. Uh, but we have some actually really cool announcements. Uh, the first announcement, very amazing announcement, is uh, the online course that we did. I think maybe some of you took it. If you didn't, uh, it's, it's still up. We decided to leave it up indefinitely. So when you sign up, you can watch it at your own pace and uh, learn in your own home, in your own schedule. It was kind of like an intro to Cha Dao. So, you know, a practical and kind of spiritual approach to tea and to a tea practice. And uh, was, oh, it's over seven days. And there's a forum and stuff. Anyway, it went uh, extraordinarily well. Um, it was the first thing of its kind that we've done, and we really actually enjoyed it. There's, uh, you know, things to be lost by doing a course online, obviously. Uh, people are looking at screens and we're not able to share tea together. But there's also things to be gained in that you can watch it at your own pace. It kind of lands in your own schedule as opposed to coming somewhere, having a retreat, and then having to go back home and figure out how to take what you've learned and integrate it into your life. It's kind of integrated as it's digested, which I think is kind of cool. So uh, we decided to do a second course uh, in November. And uh, it's launched now. It's on our uh, course website, which is teahutcourses.com. And uh, this course is going to be all about boiled tea, which is super exciting. It's in my favorite way to make tea. It's a, my favorite uh, brewing method. It's the oldest brewing method on earth, most likely. Um, and uh, it's a very rich and, and beautiful way to make tea and connect to very ancient kind of alchemical and Taoist and you know it's like almost Harry Potter it's like potion making and cauldrons and it's really like you know a really awesome uh, way to prepare tea and provides access to aspects of tea that you've never tasted and or never experienced as well that aren't available otherwise because you're obviously you're boiling the leaves and breaking them down in a very different way so it's a real magical brewing method and uh, yeah, this course will be uh, very different than the, first, than the first one. The first course was really about uh, starting or deepening a life of tea. So it was kind of about the course we divided arbitrarily into like heaven and earth each day. So, you know, heaven not as in paradise, but as in like philosophical and, and, uh, and to have earth as in the practical of how to make tea. So the course was divided that way. So it was really about... Um, as much ab halfway, as much about like, you know, the, the way of life, the way of seeing the world that is tea, along with the practical aspects of brewing tea ceremonially. So it was, it was a very strong focus on ceremonial approach to tea, uh, medicinal approach to tea, uh, you know, the things that are our forte. This boiled tea course will be different because it's going to be a lot more of the earth. It's going to be a lot more technical. It's going to be a lot more um, how to boil tea. And there will be some, you know, stuff in there, but it's not, it, this isn't a course for like learning how to practice tea or incorporate tea into a spiritual practice. This is a course for learning how to boil tea. And uh, there's a lot that goes into boiling tea and, and a lot of the elements that you learn in learning how to boil tea are also applicable then to other uh, brewing methods as well. So in this course, we're gonna we're gonna learn about the 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 alchemical or philosophical side. Will be we'll we'll dive deeper into the five elements and how they relate to tea. 
we're going to learn a few uh, boiled tea methods, uh, casual and ceremonial, and uh, yeah, and focus on all the elements that go into that. So it, it's going to be in November, but like the course that's up now, you're going to be able to uh, keep your passcode and access it at your own pace. So the course is going to be starting in November 21st and uh, go for there for five days, but you don't have to join for those five days. In fact, some of the, um, some of the days aren't going to be live. Uh, the reason is because um, we want to show you like our outdoor boiled setup and we can't really stream from maybe the locations where we'd like to shoot. So, um, though the course is scheduled from November 21, you can really take it at any time and you can take it at your own pace, just like the last one. And like the last one, it will have all kinds of subsidiary materials and bonus videos and, uh, homeworks and things and, and lots of cool stuff to, to learn all about boiled tea and, uh, exciting news also, um, connected to that on the website right now, we have a whole new web page filled with boiled tea sets so that you can go right now and get all the boiled teaware that you need and tea for, uh, for the upcoming course. In fact, some of the teas that are used that are in there in the boiled tea sets and the web page are going to be used in the course. So on that page, we have cauldrons and cauldron sets that come with bowls, side handle boiling sets and side handle that come with bowls. And we have some tea sets too. So you can get, um, smaller or larger quantities of, uh, uh, all the teas that are really ideal for boiling that we have now and all, uh, discounted. So that allow you, uh, if you go now you, or soon you can, um, you know, have that stuff shipped to you and you'll have the boiled teaware that you need to join the course. Um, just like the previous course, it's going to be, uh, cheaper for you if you sign up before. So if you sign up from now until the time of the course, uh, it will be $108 and then it will go up after the course, just like the last one. So you should sign up uh, early as soon as possible, reserve your spot. And uh, it'd be super exciting to boil tea with you guys for five days. It's really, it's really one of my favorite things. If I wasn't uh, writing and making magazines and you know teaching, I'd probably be serving boiled tea roadside. It's one of my favorite pastimes. So um, it really is a magical, magical way to make tea, a magical way to prepare tea and, and uh, kind of lost to the world. So I encourage you to get a cauldron or at least a side handle for side handle boiling and um, sign up for the course. I'm really excited to, to explore this subject with you. I hope you guys are excited too to take it and if this one continues to be successful like the last one, then we'll continue to do um, more courses in the future. Like it. So uh, that's really exciting. I hope you guys are excited as I am. You can head over to teahotcourses.com and sign up. Um, the other thing I wanted to just offer you, because you've come here to this broadcast, you, I'm going to give you a secret tip and you're going to maybe be the ones that uh, you get the early, the, you're the early birds, so you're gonna get the worms. But uh, there's just today a really very unique and special tea that we just put up on the website and it's also very uh, limited. I think there's only 50, 60 bags of it. Um, and it's called Moonbeam. And it's a, it's a 1970s or 80s, we don't know, uh, white tea. So it's a very well-aged uh, white tea. It's a Taiwanese white tea, which is unique as well. Uh, white tea actually comes from Fuding. Uh, it's white because of a mutation uh, that began in the Song Dynasty. In fact, it was Song Hui Zong's favorite tea at that time. In fact, they say the only white tea trees were belonged to the emperor. But uh, the gist of it is that you know tea produce a lot of tannins, so not many bugs like to actually eat tea. The reason that most farms have to use pesticides is because they've deforested the mountain. So the bugs don't have anything else to eat. When you deforest an ecology, you know, that's when you're starving, you eat spam. 
You know, if, if it's apocalypse and you, you got to eat it, eat something nasty, eat something nasty, right? So the bugs will eat it if they're forced to, but if as long as there's diversity, not too, there are some bugs that, that will eat tea, but not too many. Uh, be, and that's one of the reasons is because tea can produce a lot of tannins, so it's very bitter and uh, the bugs don't like it. But when the buds come out, when the little baby buds come out, they haven't yet produced chlorophyll, they're not capable of producing tannins, they're sweeter, and therefore, um, this is like most plants, right? The buds are the delicious part for the herbivores. And so uh, the insects will eat the, the buds, and that's why buds are used actually in a lot of uh, different types of tea. And uh, so this plant mutated and, and grew this kind of hard, uh, downy coating and they have like hairs, silvery white hairs over the buds and then those go away when the leaf opens up and becomes green. And they're kind of whitish silver and they, they just protect some of the buds. So um, that's kind of what makes it white. And real white tea then would be from Fuding. But from the end of the end of the Qing, so Qing is uh, 1644 to 1911, so basically end of the 19th century, early 20th century, around that time, all the way up until the 70s, um, Taiwan, late 70s, early 80s, Taiwan was producing a lot of uh, commercial grade teas to compete with China. Um, Taiwan hadn't as yet as much. It was happening more and more as a slow process, hadn't yet put its own like terroir its own teas on the map as strongly as it as it would um, that though that process of putting Taiwanese tea on the map really began you know mid Qing and so it's a very slow process but there was ongoing that kind of that kind of thing and and so a lot of you know green teas and uh, and white tea were produced in northern Taiwan um, they're typically in Fuding there are there are different type, grades of white tea. So the highest grade we call silver needle. It's all, the, it's all buds. And then the next uh, is like some buds and leaves mixed. These, these decisions were done just to uh, increase volume, basically, commercially. And the next, so the next one down is called Bai Mudan, white peony. And then, um, and then there's one that's all leaves. So like Shomei, long, longevity eyebrows. Um, this one, judging by the appearance, is, again, it's like a 40-year-old tea, so hard to say. It certainly has buds in it. Whether it was all bud, I don't know. Whether it actually even came from a tea that had the mutation of uh, white buds, uh, you know, you can't tell at this point, but I would say that's very likely. Um, it may just have been processed like a white tea, though. That's also possible that it's called a white tea just because of processing and then it really wouldn't be a white tea if it didn't, wasn't from that tree that had the white, the mutation to have the white buds. But most likely it also was that. It's just impossible to tell at this point. Um, people often ask me if, you know, are all teas ageable? And absolutely they are. The aging of tea is, is um, you know, either oxidation or oxidation and fermentation. So in the case of this tea, it's, it's oxidation. It's, oxid it's continued oxidation like with oolong. Um, these teas were traditionally aged back in the day. Um, white tea production, modern white tea production in Fuding, um, even though those trees go back to the Song dynasty and they you know, belong to Song Huizong, white tea production doesn't go back that far. It goes back to Ming or Qing. There's debate on that early Qing, Ming. And... Uh, so it, it was aged by tea lovers then, but that kind of fell out of fashion. And then with the poor boom, um, resurfaced a, a trend of aging white tea again. In fact, they, they're even now in Fuding compressing it into cakes to like ride the poor bandwagon, like some other teas. Um, though it's not ideal to be compressed in cakes. Um, anyway, this, this, is a, this is a really, really magical tea. It's really a really special and unique and educational opportunity to drink something really amazing. It's very old, uh, very sweet, very patient. You get many, many brews out of it and uh, has a really, really wonderful, magical chi that is really unlike um, other teas. You, you won't most likely drink something like this again. 
it's very hard. It's very rare. This is only a few times in my life I've come across very, very well aged white tees. So, um, and again, it's very limited, but it's on the website now. So you came to this broadcast. I'm giving you a tip, an insider tip. I would go get some moonbeam before it's gone. There's only 50, 60 packets, so I assume it'll be gone very quickly, and uh, it's affordable, and you'll be happy that you did. Um, yeah. So, and we also have a new tea. This is the one I'm drinking now is actually really cool, but this one's less uh, pressure because it's not so limited, so you could order it whenever you like. But we, we were looking for this year to have a, a mao cha that could be used leaves in a bowl. Every year for Light Meets Life, we, you know, we have some cakes, and, um, but we wanted a mao cha so that you could use it like big leaves from ancient trees that you could use in this brewing method, leaves in a bowl. And uh, it comes from Da Shui Shan, which is Big Snow Mountain, and so we call it Snow Swept, and it's from ancient trees there. Very beautiful, very floral and citrusy and very deep yin energy. Just a few leaves of this in a bowl, and it's a real magical um, liftoff. And I believe that's up on the website too. Really good, but not as much pressure to get it. Um, the Moonbeam, you'll be lucky to be one of the people that gets it. I would, I would do so real quick before it goes away uh, because that's a precious tea that you may not get another chance to drink something like that. So uh, we can, uh, any questions you like, we can talk about the classics issue. Hopefully you're reading it. There's some really amazing uh, wisdom in this month's one, in this part two. Some really cool stuff. Um, and, uh, or the, the tea of the month, the charcoal roasted oolong, traditionally processed oolong, or any other tea questions you want to ask, or Zen questions. Mike Creeper is asking, I love when you talk about stories of ancient tea masters. Could you please share what one of your favorites is? One of my favorites. Um, so the person, this person is asking if I would share an old tea story. <laughs> yeah, I love tea stories. Um, I'm trying to think of one that's not too long. Yeah, okay, so... Uh, this uh, samurai had this uh, had this uh, tea master who was you know they say the Hideyoshi said about Rikyo that when he prepared tea there was like the greatest swordsman there was nowhere to penetrate and uh, this samurai his teacher the, it was uh, had this quality too of nowhere to penetrate it's like Diencha, samadhi perfect. Uh, Shamatha, perfect concentration, no distraction, no ability to distract. And this samurai was sitting with his buddies and bragging about his tea master and about how, you know, it's absurd, but students are absurd. So he, he bragging, you know, my tea master is the greatest tea master and he's like a great swordsman. You can't penetrate or disturb him in any way. He's so you know, if we could have, if I could have that energy in my swordsmanship, I'd be the greatest swordsman, you know, I'd be Musashi, I'd be the greatest swordsman ever. And uh, on and on he bragging, they're drinking sake, getting drunk. And uh, eventually, and his, you know, his buddies are like testing him and prodding him. And eventually they offer him a wager and his heart probably, like most times like that his heart probably gave him a warning that this wasn't a good idea but uh he was felt embarrassed and you know he was kind of drunk so he he fell into the clutches of his buddies and decided to participate in this wager and the wager was they going to schedule uh, have the tea master invite them over for tea and then as the the, the tea master would come to the gate to greet them and as they were walking back to the tea hut, they would have uh, four of their soldiers, of their footmen, jump out of the bushes and fire their guns. Their guns would be have blanks. So just powder, no, no uh, bullet, no metal. Just 
to see. The idea was that the Team Master would fall over and be all frightened like a chicken, and then they would laugh at the guy who was bragging. So the appointed day came about for this nefarious wager, and uh, they went there for tea. And the Team Master came out to greet them, and they turned to walk back up the path, and they say that the soldiers jumped out and fired their weapons. And even though those samurai all knew that it was coming, they still all like cowered and ducked and fell off of the path, the roji, the path of stones, whereas the team master did not miss a stride. Walked inside as though nothing had happened and also didn't mention it. So that's a good story. There's a lot to unpack in it. And Joker is asking, uh, can you please explain the significance of the turning of the bowls three times? I'm always asked this after ceremonies and want to make sure I'm relaying it with justice. Um, well, three is just three. It's in, there's magic in three. I mean, that depends really kind of what your... Um, so, you know, in tea ceremony... Everything that has practical significance also has ceremonial significance. But not everything that has ceremonial significance has practical significance, right? Mostly, there, everything has both. It's mostly. I'd say it's like, I don't know, randomly 95%. So 95% of movements, gestures, whatever, have practical significance. In other words, they have practical reasons why we do them. Don't bump this. Don't, you won't break this etc. And they also have ceremonial significance. But there are some things that have ceremonial significance that don't have any practical significance. There are those 5%. So they only are there for ceremonial significance. And so since these things are very ancient, you know, you can articulate them very deeply from a personal perspective, from a linear perspective, lineage perspective from a tradition perspective but three is essential in all uh, you know traditions from indigenous to buddhist christian you know the father the son the holy ghost to in for me in zen i would say buddha dhamma and sangha um you know but this, your question is kind of twofold. So, but so for me, so for me, the, it, this would be Buddha Dhamma and Sangha because mine is a Zen lineage, a Buddhist lineage. Um, but I, I don't, I don't like to. Um, you know, after tea ceremonies, you know, sometimes people want to just chit chat, and uh, their questions might just be coming from uh, a desire to connect energetically, polite conversation like mild, mild intellectual curiosity. Um, and so I tend not to go too deep into things. And um, so I might just say, you know, that has ceremonial significance in my tradition. And leave it at that. And, as opposed to saying, you know, I don't know. It depends really on the audience. So it's not, there's no formula, but... For me, this is, is, you know, signifies the, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. You mean, I assume when you're taking things out, the threes and everything throughout the ceremony are that. Hmm. But, but there's more. Even in Buddhism, like, that can go deeper, right? Form, formless desire, the f three realms of, of past, present, and future, etc., 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 so... This, the streets can be unpacked very deeply. Swill is asking, can I ask about stress management advices we can take from Zen teachings? Stress management. Um, well, stress, you know, human, human suffering, we were just talking about this yesterday. Is, uh, human suffering is a, uh, Stress is, is I think, a, a feeling often, anyway. There, I think there are mo different kinds of stress. 
and we could break down stress into all kinds of different types of stress. You could technically say a pain in my leg is a type of stress. But I think mostly when people in general refer to stress, you're talking about a feeling of too much to do and not enough time to do it in. Right? I would, if you're, if you're, if you're talking about, um, you know, will I lose my job? I would consider, I would more term that worry. I know that's just semantic, but that's more worry. Uh, stress, I think, is more of a feeling of, of too much to do and not enough time to do it in, right? And so the analogy we often use around here is uh, that can help because I think everybody can relate to it. Is what does it what does it feel like when you sit down on a let's say Saturday morning to drink tea? and you don't have anything else planned for the rest of the day, you're free. Versus when you sit down to drink tea before work on a Tuesday and you have a whole bunch to do later in that day. So first is, is, is the important realization that let's say just to keep this, um, this thought experiment more objective, let's say that both of those tea sessions are 90 minutes long, exactly. It just turns out. Not because they were planned that way, it just turns out, let's say. They're both 90 minutes long. So you see, the duration of the tea ceremony is the same. The duration of the tea session is the same. And in both cases, in the case of the Saturday, during those 90 minutes, the fact that there's nothing else to do later in the day, or the Tuesday, that there is a lot to do later in the day. The lots to do later in the day or nothing to do later in the day, neither of those are real. Those are just projections. Those are just feelings. They aren't in the present moment, in the 90 minutes. They aren't relevant. They aren't real. So ideally, you know, the Buddha says in the, in the Lotus Sutra, we t to live our lives as though we're passing through Saha. With Saha, this is Saha, this samsara, this world, this life, this incarnation. You know, we're attempting to live as though everything we do is, is a Saturday afternoon, a Saturday morning. Saturday morning mentality. Free. Easy going. And uh, even if there's lots of work to do, easy going. And that attitude is, is, is you know, ultimately what we're trying to cultivate. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh has a beautiful poem. I, I wrote it down. We were talking about it yesterday. I don't know if I can recite it exactly, but it said... the. Uh, what we're trying to build will, will take a thousand lifetimes. But look, my dear one, it was already done a thousand lifetimes ago. So is that's about the relaxation kind of into, uh, into what's happening. And the practical way to... Um, Absorb that Saturday stroll through samsara. Make your life a Saturday stroll through saha. Yeah. And the way to do that, you know, my teacher always said, there are three ways of self-cultivation. And you can take your pick of any one of them. Meditation, meditation, or meditation. So, zazen. Is the answer always zazen, 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 and uh, and you know then you understand. But you can begin to also see see uh, clearly that actually whether there's lots to do later on or not lots to do later on isn't real. This moment is real, and so how to live through saha like a Saturday afternoon. Harriet is asking, 
Is there a preference for an evening tea and ceremony? Um, yeah, I mean, evening tea, so there's a, evening tea, it's, you certainly you don't want to drink like a red tea, it like would keep people awake. Um, we have some GABA on our website, GABA is really good. It, um, so GABA is a chemical, and um, you can look it up because it's a really long word. And it, uh, it's in all tea, but um, GABA tea is actually withered in a vacuum. Which is kind of strange because withering is oxidation, so it's oxidized without oxygen. It's withered in a vacuum, and that causes, um, basically, this, this I'm oversimplifying, but that causes um, the production of that chemical, GABA, to increase. So that's very high, up to 200 times more than what it normally is in tea. And uh, that is a, GABA is a muscle relaxant. It's very good for the brain, um, and it can um, help people get to sleep and sleep better. It's very mild. It's not intoxicating. It's just a very gentle muscle relaxant. And we have it in our brain naturally also. Um, so yeah, that's a good one uh, for the evening. Um, sometimes show pour, some show pours, some show pours are maybe not, but some show pours, aged pours are good too. But really it's a tea by tea basis. Don't serve tea to others that you're not familiar with is a good practice in tea. So you get to know your teas before you serve them to others. Unless the um, premise of the tea session is to taste new teas. But GABA is the easiest answer. Uh, are there any general guidelines for selecting an ishing pot for a specific type of tea? Um, like shape, thickness, spout, clay, etc. So are there different guidelines for selecting an aging pot for different types of tea? Absolutely. Um, this, this is a very deep topic. Um, so the first hurdle, and this is a big one, the biggest hurdle, when, how do you select an aging pot for tea? This person asking like, you know, for, for a specific tea. Uh, traditionally, um, aging pots were paired with specific teas and, um, only used for that tea. And though that is ideal, that is not n necessary. That can be overstressed, I think, by those not in the know. And uh, so certainly if you have one eaching pot, you can use it for all types of tea. Um, if you do that, I would recommend, first of all, that you don't leave any leaves in it. So immediately after every session, you take the leaves out, clean it out immediately. And second, you'll, you will have to scour it every six months or a year. And you will lose the benefit of, of uh, seasoning. But even seasoning is, a, is, a, um, is ultimately a question because eventually when a, tea, when a teapot gets really heavily seasoned, the pores get blocked and you lose some of the capillary action that, um, that holds heat. And so there is always at some point, like, but there are things to be gained by seasoning too. Um, if it's used for one tea and specifically the, there's energetic and, and uh, so in terms of chi and energy, but also in terms of flavor and aroma, there's reasons to continue seasoning, but there's reasons to scour as well. So that's all going to be a personal choice actually, for, even if it is dedicated to one uh, specific tea. So I just give you that context to the person's question, because some of you might not be aware that certain teas are, that one would select an Yixing just for certain teas. Um, but you can, if you just have one pot, you don't necessarily need to do that. But that is, that is ideal. Um, but as I said, even then, as you move into that one tea, you're going to eventually come to a decision, do you scour or not? So, and for me, that depends. It really depends on the tea and the pot. So the first hurdle in choosing an Yixing pot, the, the biggest hurdle is that the majority of Yixing pots being sold in the world today are not Yixing clay. Um, and that's a huge problem. In fact, I think it's the reason why a lot of people um, maybe purchase uh, an Yixing and then they do some tests compared to their porcelain pot and, they've, and they think, what's the hoopla? You know, there's a sign literally in Yixing when you come there that says, you know, there's only one ceramic teapot in the world, and her name is Yixing. And the, the Yixing teapots have been married to tea for 500 years. And 
th though that does ha have some, there's a lot, there's historical um, serendipity, but there's all, and there's also some aesthetics because T people, we prefer, you know, the aesthetic of Shibui, which is uh, on, on, austere, unadorned, simple. Um, and these are simple pots. That doesn't explain why Yixing pots took over the mainstream. Because mainstream people would like porcelain more. You can paint it. It's more pretty. So it, it really had to do with the relationship between this clay and tea. What it does to tea is why that happened. Right? At the end of the Ming, um, uh, Ming Taizu, you know, really outlawed him the powder tea that had been produced and started producing um, a lot of loose leaf tea. Um, loose leaf tea had been around. It didn't begin then. Like some books uh, will misinform and say, like in the Tang, they boiled tea. In the Song, they whisked it. In the Ming, they steeped it. It's, not, it's highly oversimplified. In fact, Ming Taizu is very, one of my favorite emperors in terms of just how interesting he is because he was actually a, a peasant's son and then he was a monk and then a general and then an emperor. So from peasant to monk to emperor is like gladiator. <laughs> it's like, it's just absurd, right? But it happened. And, uh, and so he grew up drinking steep tea. Because whisk tea was something for rich people. And so part of his spiel, I mean, he was all about economic reform. So that was the real impetus behind that law. But uh, part of his spiel was like, I grew up drinking steep tea. If it's good enough for the emperor, it's good enough for everybody. So at that time, all kinds of teapots began. And all the major kilns in, in China started making teapots. But for the most part, within 100, 150 years, all of them went back to making what they had making before. You know, whatever, bowls, plates, cups, and one city, every man, woman, and child in a giant radius got busy making teapots, and that's Yixing. And to this day, it has one of the highest concentrations of artisans. It's 40% artisans um, of any city in the world. Unfortunately, in the 1990s, the clay from Yellow Dragon Mountain and Blue Green Dragon Mountain, Huang Longsan and Qing Longsan, uh, they were closed. Um, the mines were closed. And so, for the most part, the clay that's being used now, a lot of it comes from Anhui, from a place called Gedong. Some of it comes from other mountains in, in Jiangsu and outside of Yixing. But it's not that, because Yixing is not really a clay. It's a mineral that is, it's an ore that's mined from very deep in the earth, 800 meters below sea level. It's, and mined, and it shows you how precious it was. Um, even 50 years ago, hundreds of people, you know, would have accidents and many die every year to mine this. And that's with modern equipment. Imagine in the Ming when they were going down there with ropes and candles. Like, it's, it's insane. You got they had a bucket water out and things. And um, so it was very, just very precious. And it's an ore that's hundreds of millions of years old and filled with minerals. Um, hundreds, hundreds of minerals. Mica, quartz. Um, it's called purple sand because it's, you know, silica, etc., etc. And uh, so... That clay is the relationship that's, that made it the teapot city. That's why it took over. That's why those other kilns went back to making what they were. It wasn't an aesthetic reason. It wasn't like everybody in China was like, oh, beautiful. No, because actually porcelain or celadon is prettier to most people. To a, to a hardcore tea person, the simplicity of Yixing is more attractive. But our aesthetics are weird, right? So it's not, that's not the ordinary. Simplicity is not the ordinary aesthetic. So the reason that it took over was the relationship the clay had to the to tea liquor. And, um, you know, I've asked some people, I don't know how accurate it is, but my friends seem to think only about 5% of um, teapots being produced in Yixing are made from actual clay. Um, there is a lot of clay left. When the two big state-run factories closed, um, they distributed all the clay that they had, both clay and ore. They distributed to um, their employees based on seniority. So a lot of it, you know, left over from the next generation might have, even in their stores, they might have tons, like literally tons. 
Um, so there, there, is, there is some left, but most workers don't work with it and they don't... What's been lost, I think, is, is the relationship. The art and craftsmanship of teapot making has continued in Yixing. But what has been lost through the communist era, through the last hundred years, is, I think, the relationship between the teapots and tea. It's not to say that they don't drink tea. They're just not as tuned in as, you know, the people in the Qingwer, I think, about the relationship of the clay to the... Um... You know, when I've asked, and I've, I've been going to Yixing every year, not this year, obviously, because all the th what's happening, but, um, you know, every year for, you know, 25 years, and many times, sometimes a year, I'm extremely interested, extremely uh, focused on this area of study, this is why I'm geeking out in the answer to your questions. I'm gonna, it's taking forever. Um, but uh, as I'll try to summarize more quickly I, 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 because I'm super interested. I'm super passionate about it. Uh, but if you ask the average um, potter in Yixing, which I have done in really dozens and dozens of cases, interviews, tons of interviews, you know, why, what would be the benefit of using real clay? Their answer is never, the answer is never like it's, it would have a better relationship on tea. Mostly in Ixing, they drink Ixing red tea and they drink it really casually as they like smoke cigarettes. And they're not, they, they're not that, uh, that tuned in. And they're not, they're, so none of them have ever answered me, oh, the benefit of using real, real tzasa clay would be it, it, the effect that my pots would have on tea. They all answer, well, it has better plasticity. It's, it's easier to, it's better to create with a little bit. But I can do just fine with this cheaper clay from Gudung. They all answer that way. So there is a disconnect even psychologically for them. And I'm not, I haven't done a ton of tests on those other clays. I'm not sure uh, what relationship they have to tea, right? And how it compares to other types of products. But I assume a lot of people get that, those and they, um, and then they wonder what the fuss is about. But when you get a real tzasa pot, then you know what the fuss is about. So that's the biggest hurdle is to find genuine clay if, if you're really interested in, in the effect that tzasa can have on tea. And that either means buying an antique pot or uh, from, a, from a, someone who has access to real tzasa clay. And that's a tricky one because they're all going to say they do, so you're going to have to learn to, you know, if you ask, they have whatever you want, right? So you're going to have to learn to... Uh, the thing about tea also, you know, a lot of misinformation can be passed down the chain. So you can have a really honest vendor who is selling a tea or a piece of teaware that isn't what they think it is. But they're not lying to you. They're telling the truth. They, it's just that they were lied to. Or even the person that, that, that it can go three people back. Do you see? It's not, um, this, is, this is the danger. So that's the biggest hurdle. After that, um, you know, the best teapots uh, are round in, and open in the center for the leaves to open. And that really is for all tea. So that's the best. That's really what you want kind of for, uh, for, all, uh, for all teas. Um, is the, you want the body to um, be round and, and open so that there's room for the leaves to open. And then from there is where you launch into, um, so that type of pot, if it is round in the middle and, and open in the middle, has a round open belly, um, it's really going to be good for all tea. So if you have just one pot, that's the kind you want to get. Um, and from there you can launch then into um, specific shapes for specific teas, like practical, like, you know, if you have striped teas, like a wee cliff tea, you're going to, you would want a wider pot so you don't have to break the leaves to get them in and they have more room to open and they're easier to get in because the opening's more big and the body's big enough to hold them etc um, and there are others like you know for red tea we want thick walls and tall pot etc um, yeah so you know that you can you can geek in in lots of directions for picking different pots for different um, things we have a whole issue on Yixing of global tea at that's uh, the largest English publication on Yixing in the world because it was one of our extended editions. So it was a very, very deep, long, 100 pages, I think, 100 some pages, uh, very deep. 
it has a lot of uh, good good information, including some information about selecting the shape for the type of tea. Um, as far as clay, for us, um, in our tradition, we only use purple sand. Um, it's very popular, some of the, so there's three families of clay in Yixing. There's pur uh, pur purple sand, um, and it's called the purple sand city because that's the clay that made it famous. And then the deeper clay from deeper down is uh, red, and those clays are called, you know, hongni, the types of red clays. And then there's what's called segmented clay, is clay that comes from in between layers, and that's called duani. Um, duani, every little chunk of it is really unique because it is, it's segmented. It's the like sedimentary layers between layers. And so it, it can be this or that. Um, but between Hongni became very popular starting in the Qing and up until the present. And it, uh, it but mostly because it's pretty. So actually, uh, in that issue of Kobo Tiet, we have some um, 10x photos, and you can look um, between Zaza and Hongni. And uh, Hongni is missing up to hundreds of minerals that are in Zaza. So it's missing a lot of the, they both have a lot of iron. The Hongni obviously has more, that's why it's red. But uh, it's, it's, you can see it's missing the, when you magnify it, you can see that it's missing the, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the minerals that are that are there in, in purple sand. So purple sand is really the clay that made Yixing famous. It's the clay that, in fact, all three of the clays, confusingly, are also called purple sand. And that's because that's the clay that kind of sold the place and did what I talked about in the Ming. So um, in our experience, purple sand is always going to, good purple sand is always going to make the best tea. Sorry to geek out so much. But I, we, we could sit for hours and obviously talk about Yixing. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. Okay, I think last question. Adam Dredd is asking, are there any news about the process of uh, building the new tea center light and site? And well, when will we likely be able to host guests again? Ah, so news about Light Meets Life. Um, I have no idea when, when and what we, as recently we put up a video, we found a really cool kind of uh, cool spot. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it is viable, um, but you know, negotiations here in Taiwan aren't so, I think in, the, in, the, in America at least, you know, people like, there's kind of a stronger standard of like pricing, like, you know, houses in this neighborhood cost between this and this. And you kind of show up and you know you can bargain. You can bargain from here to here. You know, you, you know, like you can probably offer this and they'll accept it. And there's like a kind of like a better standard. Whereas here it's just like, and they'll just throw a crazy price at you, right? It's a little bit like India where like I, I've literally, I lived in India for, for some years, uh, four or five years. A lot of you know that. And literally I've, in India, I've literally walked into a shop and asked how much something was. And dude, like, told me like 20,000 US dollars. And I ended up buying it for like $30. <laughs> so it's like you started at 20,000 US dollars and you walked out for $30. It's just like, that's this, that's the way that it flows. They're just, you know, that kind of thing. And that kind of thing is here as well, I, I feel, in the um, thing. So it really is a, a good property, but. Um, their initial price was just, you know, like like that, like outlandish, outlandish. Um, uh, if you really want details, their initial price was like five million U.S. dollars, and uh, it's just crazy. It's not worth anything like that, and you know we're not going to spend that anyway. Um, so we did a bunch of homework, and of, of like prices of places in the in that in that neighborhood and you know how much their building cost by you we, we can figure out you know you can check these things you can go on government database see what they paid for the land and you can see about what they've spent and so we figured out what um you know what it was actually worth and uh we made an offer to them and they grumbled and blah, 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 about the offer and then um made a counter offer that was also absurd and that's kind of where it stands right now and so we're kind of trying to, you know, not push because it's like, you know, the way you get that $30 thing in India is like, you gotta, like, you gotta be ready to leave. 
you got to be ready to say like, you know, look, this is what I'll give you. And you got to, it's like final offer. You got to be able to leave and they got to then say, well, you know, this is really, because this is what they've offered as a fair price. And um, yeah, so, you know, really hard to say. In the meantime, we continue to look and um, the potential for getting to some land and starting to, and building our own centers there as well. Um, but there's not there's not a time frame right now. Um, we still need to raise more money. We need to, uh, you know, start if the location if we're gonna build, if we're gonna get land and build then, um, you know that that process will take more time. This place was just needed to be like converted, which was something cool because it had room for building, but it also had room to get started sooner, which is why we liked it. But um, it, yeah, so. Um, we continue to look and scour the, the, also the, the other complication is that the, um, the land zoning laws in Taiwan are extremely complicated. Like there's people who uh, just for a living, that's what they do is advise you on the, like almost like a lawyer. You need one of these like land pe people to advise you on the extremely complicated zoning laws. It's like what you can do with like farmland versus forest land versus like, and then there's like seven categories of building land that I don't even know how to translate. They're like, you know, I don't know. We probably have similar stuff like that. I'm just not, I've never gotten involved in anything and, and uh, don't in the West and, and don't know, but it's just complicated. The whole thing's very complicated. Um, but we're trying to do it as like I said earlier, like a Sunday stroll through the Sahaya world. Even you got lots to build. It was really built a thousand years ago. So, um, even though there's lots to do, there's blueprints, there's uh, negotiations, there's money, there's this and that. Um, we trying to do it on a Sunday stroll with that kind of energy. So um, you need to continue to fundraise if you can uh, help us out. There's a lot of ways. Of course, sign up for Global Tea Hut, um, purchase tea and teaware from the website, which you're probably drinking tea anyway. So, or maybe you need an Ishing pot. We have a couple of really cool Ishing pots that are made from genuine clay. It's a sock clay on our website. Um, or, you know, kettles or boiling tea sets or, you know, whatever you, you purchase. And then of course we have the GoFundMe. You could just give money towards Light Meets Life. And, um, the sooner we, um, you know, it, it will keep raising money, keep looking for property. Two will come together, I hope, and we'll start courses and a whole new course type of course schedule, very different than before. Bigger courses, more variety. Um, I can't wait until the, I'm already having visions of the day. Um, I, and, and you can hold this vision too, all of you. Um, the vision of, uh, I can't, I can see it even in my head, like the, every January, you know, your Global Tea at Envelope comes with a catalog of like all the courses that Light Meets Life this year. And I can envision, just envision yourself like looking through that catalog and deciding like whether you want to take the like, you know, you took Kung Fu last time. Do you want to take Kung Fu level two? Do you want to learn about, you know, da, 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 or da, 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 like all the different courses that can be happening and looking at that schedule and deciding which courses you're going to take for that year. We got other teachers that are going to be coming in and helping too. So, and uh, yeah, so very exciting uh, time in our lives and hopefully all that will start to move i would i'd like for there to uh, ideally i'm praying that the first like seeds start getting planted um at least in this coming year okay so we're out of time mostly used it up geeking up about ishing sorry about that uh sign up for the boiled tea course it's gonna be red so amazing best brewing method really once you get into boiled tea you're just gonna love it um, it's going to be so much fun to, to boil tea. And we got all the boiled tea sets of tea and teaware up. So you'll have everything you need for the course. Um, it'll be cheaper if you sign up beforehand and you'll get your space for sure. So sign up for that as tea hut courses. And uh, since you came here, I'm, I gave you a tip, right? Get some moonbeam. Moonbeam is red. Yeah, and uh, you won't find much tea like that in the world. Until next time, huh? Drink lots of good tea, stay happy, healthy, like a Saturday afternoon or a Saturday morning stroll.